Welcome all. Um, today I would like to tell you about the East Rift languages, how they are related to each other and to the rest of Cushitic. This is uh, Christopher Eret's classification of Southern Cushitic. And as you can see, East Rift consists of two languages, Asa and Kwadza. And these are both extinct languages. Uh, for which data were collected when there were only rememberers of the language, not active speakers. Speakers of Asa shifted to Maasai, a Nilotic language, and speakers of Kwadza to Gogo, a Bantu language. And um, it's important to keep this in mind uh, when looking at the data. For Asa, the data consists of 300 34 lexemes, including derivations, and these are taken from uh, Christopher Eret's 1980 publication. Um, and the words in the data refer to several semantic domains, for example, the semantic domain of animals, both general terms and terms for non domesticated am animals, like uh, the word for leopard, to umok. And um, there are also terms relating to domesticated animals, like ngeris, for uh, to herd or to feed. Um, but there are also a lot of words referring to movement, often involving the body. Um, then there are a lot of nouns uh, denoting body parts, but also nouns relating to the environment. Um, and there's also a big category of abstract lexemes including both nouns uh, like the word for truth and verbs like the word to know. Then there are also lexemes that refer to cultivating. And I included terms for cooking here because I don't know where to draw the line between them. Um, and then some 20 lexemes have to do with hunting. This includes the words relating to honey. There were also some smaller categories and some adjectives, quantifiers, numerals, and possessive pronouns. Then the Quadza data consists of 973 lexemes, including derivations. And this data is from Christopher Eret, Roland Kisling, and Ludwig Kohl Larsen. And the semantic domains that can be identified in the data are Again, a, a large group of general terms for animals and terms for wild animals, like this one, the weaver bird. And some terms relating to domesticated animals. And there are also a lot of words for body parts. And just like in Asa, some of the largest categories are for the environment, cultivating and hunting. And Quetzal has relatively more words to refer to people or their status. And something that was not present in the ASA data, but was present in the Quadza data, were terms for what people wear, like Daliko, uh, women's upper garment. So that was some information about the data I'm working with. And now on to what I want to research. Uh, there are three main questions that I want to answer. And those are, are ASA and Quadza Cushitic languages? Are Asa and Quetzal Southern Cushitic languages? And are Asa and Quetzal East Rift Southern Cushitic languages? And how I want to answer these questions is by looking at phonological evidence, so identifying sound correspondences, and by looking at the morphology that is present on the lexemes, so to compare the form, the distribution, and maybe the function. And lastly, I'm looking at cognates between Asa, Quatsa, and West Rift. So let's start with the phonological evidence I have so far. These are the consonant inventories of Asa and Quatsa, and a proposed consonant inventory of Proto East Rift by Christopher Eret. A few things stand out here, for example, Eret reconstructs ejective plosives in Proto-East Rift, but I could not find these in any of the data, so I don't know what it is based on. And then in Quadza, there are uh, 
uvular stops, but these were not reconstructed by Arad and are also not present in Asa. So that's interesting. And um, Asa has lost the three Africans, if we assume uh, Arad is right, but gained one. And lastly, in both Asa and Quadza, there are nasal stop sequences or prenasalized stops, but these are not all reconstructed for uh, proto East Rift, only the alveolar nasal stop sequence. And another thing we can extract from these consonant tables is that Asa and Quadza do not have the same uh, consonant systems. Quadza, for example, has all of these sounds that I cannot pronounce um, and that Asa does not have. And Asa has j and sh, while Quadza does not. In fact, uh, Asa has a lot less consonants than Quadza. It's 26 versus 33. Um, if these two languages were once a proto-language, they must have had the same phonological system at one point in time. Therefore, it is crucial to explain the sound laws that resulted in these different consonant systems. So let's take a look at that. Uh, the quadza palatal stop uh, often corresponds to asa sh, and this one is regular, but there are only two examples. Then quadza qu corresponds to asa g or k. And both sounds occur, as you can see, but again, there were only two examples of both sounds. Next, the quadza uvular stop corresponds to the glottal stop in asa, but again, only two examples that can confirm. Uh, then the quadza labialized uvular stop corresponds to g, but this time only one example. Quadza Tl corresponds to asa d, um, and this one is also regular. And here were uh, three examples, and quadza c corresponds to sh or j most of the time, but also t. Lastly, quadza z corresponds to asa sh, but again only one example. Um, then the sounds that asa does have and quadza doesn't. Um, asa sh corresponds to either tz, s, palatal, stop, or t, which is explainable because the original sounds um, could have been merged to sh in asa but stayed in quadza. And asa j corresponds to d in quadza, which means that either Quadza simplified this sound, or Asa created a new African. When you see this overview, it seems to fit, but there are some issues. First of all, when a sound corresponds to several sounds in the other language, there is no apparent conditioning for these different outputs. For example, if you assume that Quadza keeps the labialized feeler stop, but that Asa develops K and G, which is a logical assumption because West Rift also has these labialized feelers, then the conditioning for these sounds is hard to find. Take a look at these four examples. Um, total, there are four asa examples that have k or g corresponding to qu. And if you think about it, there are only two options um, that can explain this. So either the front vowels um, because they are always followed by g, and the other vowels are always followed by k, when k and g correspond to qu. Or another explanation is that when the preceding consonant in the word is not a voice stop, the output is g, and when it is a voice stop, it is k, and this would make more sense because it is dissimulation but you would presume an earlier form where k was g. That means that q would have developed to g and not to k. And in other examples, 
there were so many correspondences that it's not possible to establish a regular rule. But maybe it can be explained by free variation. The next thing that stands out when comparing Asa and Kwadza is the length of the words. Asa words are often shorter than Kwadza words. And here you can see some examples. The ok in mongok is the gender suffix and the o in munga ayo as well. But still, um, this means that Kwadza has one syllable more than Asa. And in the next example, it's the same. And it seems that in both examples, the gender suffix was added to the shorter form in Asa and to the longer form in Kwadza. In example three, it is clear that Kwadza has some morphology, uh, which would also explain the mu in example two. And in example four as well, the morpheme ai um, is there because uh, this is a, a morpheme that occurs more in, uh, in words in Kwadza. And in example three and four, Asa does not seem to have gender suffixes at all, which would mean that if there was a gender suffix, it would also have been truncated. Talking about gender suffixes, um, these are the gender suffixes in Asa and Kwadza. Yeah, so Asa has either ok or just k for the masculine, and it has it or just t for the feminine. And Kwadza has ko for the masculine and to or o for the feminine. And it also has a, a neuter gender wa. Uh, these are uh, some examples with uh, minimal pairs to prove that these are actually contrastive suffixes. And what I tried to do was to find uh, cognates to the 334 asa lexemes that I have. So not all the quasi lexemes are taken into account here for the comparison of morphology. Important to keep in mind. Um, and from all of the asa lexemes, there were 115 nouns that either have a cognate in quasi or one in proto west rift. And from this total, there were 21 lexemes that had the same gender in asa and proto west rift. 19 that had the same gender in all three languages, 15 that had corresponding gender in Quadza and proto west Rift, 12 with corresponding gender in Asa and Quadza, and 48 with different gender in all those three languages. And for this last category, there were actually no examples of a word that was masculine in one language, feminine in another, and neuter in the last, the cases of three differing genders usually comes from uh, one missing form or the lack of a gender suffix, which happens both in Asa and Kwadza, but more in Asa. The number of lexemes with corresponding gender in Asa and proto west Shrift seems high, but this is explainable uh, just because the point of departure for this comparison was Asa, and because proto west Rift is the best described of, of these three. Um, here are some examples. You could take a look at them. Uh, note that there is, for example, no uh, cognate for the word for bows in, in Quadza. And that the Asa word Waya, meaning intestines, and Mugura, meaning ankle, uh, do not have gender suffixes, as it seems. They do both, however, end in A. Now, uh, we will go on to verbal derivation, and I will discuss three suffixes. The first one is vowel M. This can either be a passive, a gerative, a middle, or a reciprocal suffix in Cushitic. And this is a list of lexemes. It is placed on in Asa, and the cognates in Quadza and Westrift. The meanings of the words vary, and it is not clearly a passive, also not a gerative, also not clearly a reciprocal, but we could explain how it would be a middle. Um, what makes it difficult is that the meanings sometimes are the same in all three languages, like for the first one, to eat, and for the one uh, which means to see. 
but asa has a suffix im or am, which does not seem to affect the meaning at all. Another thing that makes it difficult to establish a function is that there are no minimal pairs within asa that could show a change in translation or hint at a function. Then there is vowel t, which usually is the middle in Cushitic, and the same issues arise as with the last one. Like the first example here, tla'at has a suffix and it means to love or to like, but quadza does not have a suffix and it means to purify. But then Westrift also does not have a suffix, but it means to love or to like. Um, some of the translations do really fit the middle, like for example, uh, wagit, to dress. And Asa does have some uh, interesting minimal pairs, or maybe they are minimal pairs. Um, com uh, means to have, and commit means to give birth for people. And the other one, nous, means to show, which makes sense, because we will see on the next slide that us is a causative suffix, but with the addition of the middle et, the meaning changes to to see. Here we can clearly see the causative meaning. Uh, interestingly, the word wadis uh, means to lift or to carry, um, but has a, a middle suffix in quadza that allows for the interpretation to wear. Just take a look at these uh, examples. Um, and so in quadza, for the, the causative, there's lexine to purify, which we saw before. And when you add the causative, it becomes to love or to like, the meaning that was already in Asa and proto -West Rift. Um So what I think it actually means is something like to cause to purify. And the other example of to die and to kill is also very obvious. Um, and then I want to say some things about the lexicon. Um, I took a Swadesh list of 95 words and I found this. 25 of them do not exist in the ASA dataset at all. Um, 13 of them were cognate with Quadza, but not proto West Rift. 12 cognate with proto West Rift, but not with Quadza. And 10 were only found in ASA. However, the biggest group was uh, one of 35 words that do have cognates both in Quadza and proto West Rift. I show the semantics of this group uh, here, and the biggest group was for body parts. So, what have we seen so far? We saw that Asa and Quadza consonants do not have many regular consonant correspondences. We saw that Asa words are often shorter than Quadza words, so either Asa truncated lexemes or Asa did not add number suffixes to the same lexemes as Quadza. And if it is the first option, we have examples of truncation before suffixation and truncation after suffixation. Then we saw that in most cases, gender is not the same in Asa, Quadza, and Proto West Rift. And we saw that the verbal derivational suffixes are often not added to the same lexemes. And lastly, we saw that there is a fair amount of cognates of the Swadesh list between Asa and Quadza and proto West Rift. In fact, only 72 of the 334 Asa words do not have a cognate at all. However, many only have either Quadza or proto West Rift. This brings us to some preliminary conclusions. Um, I do think Asa and Quadza are Cushitic languages uh, because we see the presence of the gender suffixes and the verbal derivational suffixes and there are enough uh, cognates with the other languages. But maybe we cannot state with confidence that Asa and Quadza are East Rift Southern Cushitic because Asa and Quadza do differ a lot from proto West Rift regarding the morphology and lexicon, and Asa and Quadza also differ a lot from each other 
regarding phonology, morphology and lexicon. But if they are not East Rift Southern Cushitic, how can some of the similarities be explained? Well, this is one of the questions uh, I need to answer. There are more, like, are there more sound correspondences? Can some of the irregularities be explained? Does Asa have an additional gender suffix A? And what are the exact functions of the verbal derivational suffixes? And how do Quadsa and proto west Rift relate to each other? Because now I focus mainly on Asa and how they relate to Quadsa and proto west Rift. Can surrounding languages tell us something about the classification of Asa and Quadsa? And what is the influence of language shift on, on all of these data? And maybe most importantly, what does all of this say about East Africa's linguistic history? That is what I will continue to look into. Thank you for listening and please let me know if you have any questions, comments or recommendations. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Iris. Um, so once again, uh, I will uh, invite our attendees uh, to uh, either write questions in the chat module or to raise uh, your hand uh, and uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, so I see a hand up, uh, that's Anna Maria, yes. Yeah, thank you. That was really nice. Um, I know absolutely, I know not very much about Eastern Africa. So uh, I found this uh, super interesting. I learned a lot. I have a question. So you talked about language shift. So the communities that spoke these languages now shifted to something else. But uh, you, you also say, okay, they have a lot in common, but there's also things that are different and cannot be explained. Do you think that substrate could play a role? I mean that uh, one of these languages, as you talked about contact, but has a substrate that is either from another Cushitic language or from a, from another language uh, from Eastern Africa. Have you looked into that? Well, I haven't looked into it, but you know there are so many uh, possibilities. Uh, the, the, the contact is something I'm really saving for later. Uh, now I've only looked at the, the data from the languages themselves and um, the next step is to also look at the contact and the shift and the possible substrates. And uh, there is something I noted, but I don't know if it's valuable or not. Um, this comment uh, you had, you said that Eret um, reconstructed ejectives, but you didn't really find ejectives in any of the languages you looked at. But you have, for example, some lexemes that start with a glottal stop. Could this be that some ejectives got reduced to a glottal stop? There is a, a case in Southern Africa where this happened. Or could you see that there maybe is a relationship between the ejectives and the uvular consonants you find, or between ejectives and uh, glottal stops or, glot or glottalized vowels that you find? Um, yeah, so the, the glottal stop um, corresponds to many sounds. So when you have a glottal stop in Asa, this can either be a glottal stop in Quadza, um, uh, and something entirely uh, different in, in proto west Rift, And there are just too many sounds uh, to really establish a rule for that. But since um, it's not found in Asa and in Quadza, I don't see a reason why you would reconstruct it. Okay, thank you. And good luck with your work. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. Bonnie. Hi, thanks. Another great talk. I wish I had taken some screenshots of some of those cognate sets, though, because then I was like, oh, what was that? I wanted to look at that again. Uh, I agree with Anna Maria there that uh, you can have like any ejective sound could turn to a glottal stop. That process is called debuccalization, and Paul, Paul Fallon has talked about that. But you do see Q corresponding to glottal stop cross linguistically, and also quest, Qs corresponding to a gu, but you said it was the uh, the rounded Q that cor uvular that corresponded to gu. So I found that interesting. I was wondering with, at, well, really uh, a question about the sounds and then a really quick question about morphology. On those sounds, are those, were those words that are found in Proto-Western Rift as well? Like, can you be sure that those were not loan words? 
Uh, not for all of them. Some of them have cognates in, in Proto West Rift, but not all of them. So, right. so um, you didn't mention that as a possible explanation for why some of the correspondences might have been skewed. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's still an option, indeed. I wanted yeah. to point that out. And then my comment about the morphology, and I'm not a morphosyntax person, is some of those words you were saying reciprocal for the VM. It, it just re reminds me of some antipassives. Did you consider an antipassive analysis for that? No, not yet. No, thank you. <laughs> okay, that's all. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll jump in with my own uh, question, Iris. Brilliant uh, presentation. Lovely to see some of that data. I'm interested in your analysis of ASA no gender suffix uh, nouns. Of course, with me, with the work that I did with Gorwa, I, I, I found gender suffixes everywhere, but of course I might exist on, on an extreme. Uh, I'm wondering what your, what your sort of criteria for saying, okay, this is a gender suffix and then this is not a gender suffix. Well, um, uh, I know there are the, the ok and the, the et or t, um, so those are the ones I identified as a gender suffix, but um, there are a lot of words uh, in in Asa that end in a or in o. So I'm not I'm not even sure if if that's maybe uh, um, the neuter. Like in Quadza, you have wa as as the neuter. Maybe it could be a remnant of that. So I, I'm not sure at all. And one, one would assume that these nouns would have gender associated with them, but from the data, you can't tell. Is that right? Well, not clearly, no, yeah. you, can, you cannot tell. But again, there's no agreement. I don't have sentences where I can see agreement of, of the gender, so. We can just, we can just sort of guess. That's, that's really interesting. And it, and, it makes me, and it makes me think, okay, well, how would we go about doing that? Um, or establishing that sort of um, filling out these these genderless forms if, if they are genderless. Um, do we have any further questions or comment? We have a couple minutes left before we begin on our next uh, on our next talk. The, uh, the some of the illustrations were beautiful, Iris. I don't know where you got them, but they were really really nice. Thank you, I made them. Oh, brilliant. Yes, uh, Martin. You'll have to unmute yourself first though. It's myself, yes. There you go. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Iris. Um, you, you, you gave us some warnings about uh, that these data were collected in the times of people were not really speaking the language anymore and, in, and that had shifted to another language. So do you, what, what kind of indications do you have of, of that, uh, that situation in the data that you look at? Do you, when, when do you think that, hey, this, this may be because of the, of the situation in which the data was collected? Well, maybe that's an explanation for why there are no gender suffixes on some of the lexemes or why uh, the sound correspondences uh, do not exactly fit. Um, yeah, and, and why you have a, a, um, so many words with a seemingly a durative or whatever we can call it, uh, but that doesn't seem to have that function. And, and, and how about this, this truncation? Um, do you see yeah. any motivation uh, from phonology of, of the shifted language that, that would need truncation? I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not even sure if it really is truncation or if there are a lot of suffixes in uh, Quadza that Asa did not have. But either way, uh, you can say that Asa did not join Quadza in adding these suffixes. Um, but I don't know if it says something about the, the language shifts. 